In this lecture, we'll concentrate on the tools we use to arrive at correct proportions. They're not all new to you. You've studied seven of them already. We'll start by reviewing the ones we've already discussed and then add five new ones. While we study each of these separately, as you repeatedly use them, you'll find yourself combining them seamlessly in your own way. They'll just become part of the way you draw naturally. As part of this lecture, we'll be making two drawings, the first with pencil on small paper, the second with charcoal on 18 by 24 inch paper. You'll also need your sharpening and erasing tools, viewfinder, and grid. We'll be drawing a cardboard box. The one I've used in the examples is 14 by 10 by 8 inches. To get a similar view, you'll want to be standing up looking down at the box. We'll get a lot of interesting angles from this viewpoint. So, it's likely best to set up with your drawing board on your easel. Let's recap our first seven tools. The first is a type of construction line, the center line. We've seen Durer use it in his figure studies, as well as Aikens in his drawing of John Bigland in a single skull. And we've used them to draw still life objects. They help establish an object's placement within the drawing and help maintain the subject's direction, here vertically. Last, they serve as an aid in drawing shapes proportionately in relation to the object's center. Our second tool is constituent or building block shape. We often use these kind of shapes with a center line or other construction line. Using these kind of shapes helps us to relate both left and right sides and the width to height of proportions of an object or part of an object. Our third tool is another type of shape, large ground shapes. These set up proportions for the whole drawing. In the drawing we'll be doing here, we'll have a lower rectangle and an equal sized upper rectangle. Together, they create the overall proportions of our drawing. Next is aggregate shape. We look at our subject and imagine a simple shape that could contain it, a shape that captures the height to width proportion. As we study our aggregate shape, we can even trace over it in the air to get a sense of its proportions and then draw it on the page. This set of construction lines tells us where our subject should be located and how large it should be. Using ground and aggregate shapes together will define and help us control the overall proportions in our drawing. Using these concepts helps us avoid running out of space for what we want to include in our drawing. It also helps us to work from the general to the specific. That keeps us from getting bogged down in details prematurely. And that saves us time and exasperation because we're able to avoid drawing time-consuming details that have to be erased because they're not in proportion or they're in the wrong location. Our fifth tool is used in, in conjunction with the prior four. We refer to it as eyeballing. We look at the shape we've drawn and ask ourselves if it corresponds to what we're seeing. This could be applied when evaluating part of a still life object, like the body of a vase or bottle, or it could be eyeballing the height to width proportion of a wall in a room, as you likely did in the hallway project, or as we'll be doing assessing aggregate shapes in this drawing. Our sixth tool is negative shape. We tend to see these more accurately than the positives because we have no preconceptions about what they look like. This allows us to see them in a purely visual and analytic manner. In this drawing, we'll have a large upper negative and a large lower negative. Taken together, they reveal the silhouette of the object in accurate proportion. Here's a further refinement on gauging large, complex negatives. By holding your pencil against a negative, arm extended, one eye closed, you can break it up into more memorable pieces. This transforms a complex shape into two simpler shapes, one on the right, another on the left. Easier to remember like this. And if a shape's easier to remember, it's going to be easier to draw. We can also use our pencil horizontally. So let's make a drawing of the box combining these techniques. If you pose your box similarly to the way I've posed mine, it will help you follow the directions. In this example, we're looking down at the box and it's framed so that there's space on all sides, above, below, left, and right. This guarantees that the box will sit back in space. The point of view is such that the back edge of the table meets the wall along a horizontal. I've posed the box so that two flaps are pointing up and two are pointing down. This offers a range of angles to deal with. The format shape in the example is three to four. It's a three-four rectangle, specifically four and a half by six inches. 
You could make yours somewhat different if you like, but make sure to frame your box in your viewfinder using whole or half inch increments for the, fo uh, for the format shape. Once you frame your drawing in your viewfinder, trace the format shape on our eight and a half by 11 inch paper. Look at the two large ground shapes. These are your two largest planes, the table and the wall. Draw this with a single line at the appropriate height. Eyeball your large division. Then look back out through the viewfinder. If there are discrepancies, correct as necessary. Next, gauge the aggregate shape of your box. How wide is it? How tall? Lightly draw a rectangle to express this. Now, eyeball the rectangle and look back out at your box. Trace a rectangle over it in the air. Then look back at your page. Ask yourself if they're the same. If not, adjust. Look back and forth a couple times until you feel you're confident you're about right. Now, let's turn to negative shape. First, looking out through your viewfinder's window, trace around the upper negative in the air. Then the lower one. Now, work your way around the box. Break the complex negatives into manageable bite-sized pieces. Eyeball as you go, and adjust the proportions at each step. By following this method, you'll construct your box's silhouette. Once complete, eyeball all the pieces and make any changes necessary to bring it closer to proportionality. Now, add the large negative in the center of the box that defines the bottom edges of the two rear flaps. Then, the negative surrounding the right front flap. And the negative surrounding the left side flap. Now, one last line to express the change of plane in the interior of the box. Look out through your viewfinder and eyeball all the shapes and adjust as needed. When you feel you're in pretty good shape, erase any of your construction lines in the negatives. Do a little more eyeballing and correcting, and you should have a reasonably proportionate drawing of your subject. These tools are all useful. With practice, they can provide us with good results, but they're rather general. Our next set of tools allow for greater specificity of measure. The first of these is the gridded picture plane the Velo of Alberti. As we've seen, this helps us plot specific locations. Let's see how we could apply it to this drawing problem. First, we'd fix the grid into our viewfinders. Then, lightly with a well-sharpened 4-H pencil, we draw the format shape and an identical grid on our paper. In our last drawing using the grid, we had five major planes and used eight points to construct them. Here we have 10 planes two in the tabletop and wall, and another eight in the box. We'd need 21 points of intersection to make this drawing. We'd place a small mark on our gridded page for each location. Check the locations against what we see through the viewfinder, make any changes needed, and connect the dots. If you liked working with the grid, you could use it to check the drawing you just did using negative shake. So those are our first seven tools. The next set were derived from what artists came to understand by analyzing what they were seeing using tools like the Velo. And that brings us to our next tool, number eight. It represents a means for quantifying those tricky angles. You'll need two pencils. New full-length ones are best. Take the first and hold it out in front of you with your left hand vertically. Point up. If the screen you're using is vertical, you can hold the pencil flat against the screen the first time. Now, closing one eye, rotate your pencil so that it comes into line with the angle of the box, like the pencil here. Now, take a second pencil in your right hand and place it pointing straight up from the eraser end of your first pencil. Now, I'd like you to imagine your pencils are hands on an analog clock face. Then, tell the time. Here, about 13 minutes to noon. And that represents a way to quantify and remember an angle, makes it much easier to draw. 
We just read this angle as an acute one. We could e equally read it as obtuse. Depending on whether you're right-handed or left-handed, one way or the other may be more comfortable. So let's hold the first pencil in our right hand, but instead of holding it against the screen, hold it a couple inches away. But make sure it's vertical, point straight up. Close one eye, then rotate it so that it comes into line with the angle. Hold the second pencil up to 12 in your left hand. Imagine that clock phase. Ask yourself what time it is. Here, about 1218. Once you've done this a couple times, you can imagine the hour hand, and you'll only need a single hand and pencil to measure the angle. Let's try it that way now. Look at the angle of the flap on the far right. Rotate your pencil to coincide with the angle. Imagine another pointing to 12, then the clock face, and read the time, about seven minutes after the hour. You might want to practice this a bit without drawing at all. Walk around your home or office, Look at angles in your ceilings, windows, doors, kitchen cabinets, tables, anything that angles forward or back in space, and quantify it. Practice doing this with one pencil. It's going to make it much easier when you're actually working on a drawing if you've done some rehearsal. The most important thing to remember is to hold your pencil parallel to an imaginary picture plane, as if it were held against a glass plane perpendicular to the floor or on a flat clock's face. You don't want to tip your pencil into space. You've likely seen an actor portraying an artist doing this, holding out his arm, closing one eye, and looking out over his thumb. That's a version of our next tool, number nine. It allows us to measure vertically and horizontally across the picture plane, and it will help us measure proportions, amounts, and distances. This is how it works. We want to identify some part of what we're seeing to use to measure everything else. We call this a standard unit of measure. In choosing the unit, there are a couple factors to keep in mind. First is orientation. We want something that's parallel to the picture plane. We don't want anything that's tilting back into space. Anything receding will be less clear in terms of measure. In fact, it's best if what we choose is a self-contained unit and is vertical or horizontal. There's a second factor to consider, scale. Measuring a person's height in feet and inches makes all the sense in the world. But for the distance between New York and LA, feet and inches are too small. And while light years are good for measuring across the universe, they'd be too large for New York to LA. So we use miles. The point here is that for any unit of measure to be useful, it can't be too big and it can't be too small. Looking at our box on the table, the front edge of the box may be our best bet. While it's a couple degrees off true vertical, it will still work for our purposes. This is what I'd like you to do. Take a well-pointed pencil, hold it vertically, point up, with one eye closed. Outstretch your arm fully. Align the pencil's tip with the top of the standard unit of measure. With your thumb and first finger, hold the pencil at the base of the standard unit of measure. You've now captured the unit on your pencil, and you can use it to measure across a picture plane. Here's how. Continuing to hold the pencil in the same place between thumb and first finger, lift your arm straight up so the thumb and first finger come level with the inside corner of the box. That would be the top of our standard unit. We've stacked our measure on top of the unit itself. This reveals that the point along the back flap directly above the front corner of the box is just a little less than one standard unit above the unit itself. We'd also note that the point where the pencil traverses the hinge of the flap is a bit over half a measure from the top of the corner. We can sum up what we've discovered about these locations. The top of the flap is a little less than a one measure above the standard unit. The hinge of the flap is a little more than half a measure above the standard unit. We can also turn our hand 90 degrees and measure right and left across the picture plane. Let's measure from the standard unit, our box's corner, out to the near corner on the left flap. This reveals that the distance is a little less than 40% of a unit. The core idea is that once we've placed our standard unit of measure in our drawing, we can measure from it to locate any other point we might need. We're going to elaborate on this method when we get into the drawing itself. Our tenth tool is a straight line. 
either horizontal, a horizontal level line or a vertical plumb line. Here's how they work. I can turn my pencil horizontally and line it up with any point, say the far left inside corner of the box. Then I look to see if anything toward the right lines up with it. No perfect line up here, but what I do learn is that the far right inside corner is just a little bit higher than the left. So I can use this tool, a level line, to see how things line up and also to understand how different points or edges correlate. Take a look at the corners of these two flaps. Try and guess which one's higher. Apply our level line, we find that the far left corner is higher. We can also use this vertically as a plumb line. We don't have any clear vertical lineups in this setup, but placing my pencil vertically along the front corner reveals how the back flap should be positioned. The corner should be just off to the left, and I should have a large shape to the right and a much smaller one to the left. We now have all the tools we'll need to make our second drawing of the box. Clock hands for angles and a standard unit of measure and level and plumb lines to locate positions. This time we'll use charcoal on the 18 by 24 inch white paper. You want to draw from a fixed location with the same eye closed. And when taking measurements, extend that arm fully so it's always in the same place. The directions here are very specific, much like a recipe. I've put it together this way so you'll be able to follow the steps in clear succession. In practice, once you've done this a couple times, you'll be able to work with the basic ideas with clock hands, a standard or unit of measure, and level and plumb lines in a much more fluid and organic way. You'll find that these same procedures can be used in all kinds of drawings to draw just about anything. They can also be incorporated with the other tools we've studied. So, Let's start by framing the box in your viewfinder. Our drawing is going to be 18 by 24 inches, so make sure your viewfinder is open in the same ratio, any 3-4 ratio. The most convenient ones would be 3 by 4 inches, 4.5 by 6 inches, like mine, 6 by 8 inches, and 9 by 12 inches. Once again, note the aggregate shape of the box, a rectangle that we imagine relative to the viewfinder's opening. We want to get a sense of the box's footprint. How much width does it have to its height? You can even do a phantom tracing of the aggregate shape in the viewfinder window, right over the box itself. Do it a couple of times with the goal of getting a clear sense of that shape. You'll also want to note the negative shape, the amount of frame between the edges of your aggregate shape and the edges of your paper. Since your viewfinder is scaled in a 3-4 ratio, just like your paper, you can draw the rectangular aggregate shape lightly on the page. Then, check the shape and its negative. A bit of eyeballing here. Ask yourself if it looks like what you're seeing through your viewfinder. Make any changes that are necessary. Once you have your aggregate shape, you want to add your standard unit of measure. To do this, we have to know where to put it. Looking through your viewfinder, Ask yourself where along the bottom horizontal of the aggregate shape does a unit appear? Is it toward the center, the right, the left, and by how much? In my example, it intersects towards the right. It divides the horizontal with about 60% on the left and about 40% on the right. Once you've made this determination, make a small mark with your charcoal at this location on the page. The next step is to draw the standard unit of measure in the drawing. We're going to do this in two steps. First, take the measure of your standard unit with your pencil. Then, draw that measure with your charcoal at the location you've noted. The second step is to scale the measure. Our drawing is 18 by 24 inches. If your viewfinder opening is 3 by 4 inches, your drawing is larger by a factor of 6. If 4.5 by 6 inches, by a factor of 4 if 6 by 8 inches, by a factor of 3, and if 9 by 12 inches, by a factor of 2. My viewfinder is open 4.5 by 6 inches, so my drawing is larger by a factor of 4, and I'll scale up the standard unit of measure in my drawing by a factor of 4. You should do this relative to your own viewfinder's opening. Then check for accuracy. You're now looking at your unit of measure scaled up to your page. 
What I'd like you to do now is to hold your viewfinder in one hand and your pencil point up in the other. As we did earlier, locate the standard unit of measure on your pencil with your thumb and first finger. Now, measure from the standard unit on the box to the top opening of the viewfinder. One unit and about 80% of a unit. Now let's measure below. There we get half a unit. Even though we're drawing with charcoal, it's easier to measure with a pencil. The irregular shape of the charcoal simply makes it less precise. So now, lightly with your charcoal, draw these units on your page. If you don't have enough room for 1.8 units above and half below, it means you've drawn your standard unit too large for the page. If there's too much room, the standard unit's too small. So take a little time to check for accuracy before moving on to the next step. With our vertical measure in place, we want to add a horizontal one, too. Again, look out through the viewfinder, measure from the top of the standard unit out to the left. About two and a little over half a unit. 2.6 units all told. Then out to the right. Here we get one unit and a slightly larger fraction of a unit than on the left, about 1.7 units in all. Let's draw this on our page as well. While more complex, this is similar to what we did when we drew a square and other construction lines to help us draw a circle. In essence, we created a structure that would help us see and draw a form. And you may be thinking that what we have here on a page resembles a partial grid, a partial velo, and you'd be absolutely right. And we could easily fill in the rest of the grid based on standard units, just extend horizontals and verticals out from our existing intersections. I'll let you try that in another drawing. For our purposes here, we'll continue measuring our way through the drawing without filling in the grid. And we won't need the viewfinder anymore for this project, so let's put it aside. Instead, we'll use the clock hand technique next. Let's look at the bottom right diagonal of the box. Close one eye. Make sure the pencil is parallel to an imagined perpendicular picture plane and turn your pencil to line up with the angle. It's about seven minutes after the hour. And we'll draw a line at this diagonal moving out from the bottom of our standard unit. We haven't yet determined how long the line should be, so we'll turn to our standard unit of measure for an answer. Place your thumb and first finger at the one unit measure. Then turn the pencil horizontally, with the pencil's point lining up with the box's front edge. Now, you want to ask yourself, how far do you have to travel to the right to reach the back corner of the box? About half a unit. So, return to the drawing and measure out half a unit to the right to intersect the diagonal. And you can erase anything extra. Then repeat these steps on the other side. First, use the clock hand technique to determine the angle. Then, you want to use your pencil to measure its termination point in standard units. Last, draw the diagonal out to the left to accord with your measure. Let's finish this long left plane of the box. From the top of the front corner, we'll use the clock hand technique to find the angle. Then, the standard unit of measure to find the length. Next, we'll use a clock hand to check the angle of the left side and draw this edge as if we could see through the folded flap. Next, we'll do the same thing on the other side. Now, there's a little divot connecting the two sides, but we can eyeball that and just draw it in. Since we have our standard unit stated in the drawing repeatedly, we can erase our first standard unit and draw the slightly angled line to express the front edge of the box. This would be a good time to check the far right and far left corners using the level line. Check the lower ones, then uppers. In both cases, the right should be a little higher than the left. If anything's off, measure again using the three new tools and erase and correct. Now we'll move to the box's open top and follow the same method we used for the base. We'll use a clock hand tool for the diagonal's angles and use the standard unit of measure to calculate the length. As we did at the front corner, we can eyeball the divots where they occur. Next, we'll add the line that creates the two interior planes. And we're ready to work on the flaps. We'll start with the front right diagonal. Clock hand tool for direction, standard unit for length. Then the rear diagonal. And next, the connecting one. 
Let's locate the point along this last diagonal where it intersects the back edge of the table and draw a horizontal here. Now we'll repeat these steps with the front left flap. Let's use the pencil as a horizontal level to check the alignments of the corners. Make any adjustments you need. We're almost done, just another six angles to measure for direction and length, three for each of the rear flaps. Then erase the construction lines and the lines we drew through. And we'll make a final level line check to make sure the corners correlate. And do the same thing with our vertical plumb line. Make any necessary changes and you're done. Take a breath. We've covered a lot of material and I know it's a lot to absorb. We've been doing this in a very step-by-step, -step, even mechanistic way. All about breaking down the processes into understandable pieces. But as you use them, they become more natural and they'll be embedded in the way you scan everything you see. And I want to assure you that this isn't about a style of drawing. With practice, it just all gets absorbed and the knowledge lets you draw freely and gesturally. Whether you're drawing sleepy figures in a room like Degas or a river and landscape like Monet, it just takes time and practice. There's a related approach to what we just did, and you can try it at your leisure. Essentially, we start by using our pencil to sight and measure the height of the object, and we're doing that in relationship to its width. And we want to draw a vertical eye beam to represent the height and a horizontal one to represent the width. In essence, this expresses the object's aggregate shape and locates it in the page. Next, we'd calibrate the axes at the quarters. Depending on what we're drawing, we might want to find the eighths as well, in one or both axes. It would be very common to do this along the vertical axis if we're drawing a standing figure. The eye beams and quarter calibrations help us imagine an even grid over our subject holding our pencil so that we capture the measure of the half or quarter of the vertical or horizontal axis, we can measure our way through the drawing, finding the key points that help us draw proportionally. As with Alberti's Velo, these points don't have to line up with the grid units. We just have to know where they are in relation to the units. Our final tool, number 12, is linear perspective. For the moment, it just gets this mention but you'll soon learn it's a really powerful tool for understanding proportion. As you're coming to see, drawing can be an interrogative process. We ask one question after another. How does the picture plane divide? What's the largest shape? What's the angle of that diagonal? How long is it? The drawing represents the sum of our responses. Next, we'll talk about 12 principles that can guide us in creating the illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface and then you're going to be primed to tackle a range of interesting and complex drawing projects.